Good afternoon. Hello, my name is Claire Palmer and I work for the Members Office of the National Maritime Museum and it is my pleasure to welcome members and guests to this afternoon's program Antarctic Adventures with Tim Bowden and Tim Jarvis. This afternoon our distinguished speakers will investigate the impulse and the extraordinary lengths adventurers went to to reach the South Pole. It's now my pleasure to introduce Tim Bowden. He's an author, radio and television broadcaster and producer and oral historian. In 1993, he was commissioned by the Antarctic Division to write an official history of ANRE. And he later wrote and narrated a companion documentary, The Silence Calling 1997. He has also written and presented six other half-hour documentaries, including Breaking the Ice. Tim has now visited Antarctica eight times. In 1994, he received an Order of Australia for services to public broadcasting. Please make him welcome. I always sort of think of Antarctica as a, a rather large tadpole with the tail going back up towards South America, which, which in essence is a continuation of the Andes uh, mountain chain down into Antarctica. Now, Australia claims a rather ambitious 42% of the Antarctic continent. Now, if you claim a section of Antarctica, according to the claiming rules, you have to show what is called a sufficient display of authority. A, you've got to get there. B, you've got to do some science or some fishing or whaling, as it used to be in the old days. But we really hadn't laid a glove on the place. And it's when Sir Douglas Mawson came along in his Banzari voyages of 1929, 30, 31, 32, he sort of stooged up the coastline, but they really couldn't get ashore. And you're supposed to build a cairn and sort of say, I claim this you know, land in the name of King George and all the rest of it, with a, a sort of claiming procedure. They couldn't do that. So in 1947, ANARI, Australian National Antarctic Research Expedition, was formed with the idea of actually getting down there and, and establishing, establishing our claims. Well, meet HMAS, uh, no less, Wyatt Earp, <laughs> a former Norwegian herring trawler. Well, it was certainly the, the first and last time an official Antarctic Australian expedition would be undertaken in a wooden ship with sails. Not surprisingly, they failed to reach the Antarctic and the newly formed Anari um, had to think again. So then it was decided to set up a station on Heard Island, which is to the west of Australia, uh, sort of halfway between Antarctica and the Australian continent. Now, contrasting to that was Macquarie Island to the east of our continent, these two uh, islands were to be used as staging posts, if you like, for mounting Antarctic uh, expeditions until ships could be found that were strong enough and, and, and able to uh, get through the pack ice and reach the continent itself. In 1949, the United States mounted the single biggest expedition ever mounted to Antarctica to explore, photograph and map the entire continent to extend American influence, basically. This is one of the topographical photographs taken of part of the coast of McRobertson Land and a crucial element in choosing the site for Mawson Station. Uh, my crude arrow there uh, shows where Horseshoe Harbour is. It's the only natural harbour on the coast of Greater Antarctica. Now, this is the ship that I went down on in um, 1989 on my first visit, the Icebird. As you can see, moored in this amazing little harbour. So that was a prime bit of ice-free real estate that Australia picked up at that point. Australia had wanted to build a base in Antarctica since 1947, but they had to wait seven years to find a ship strong enough to penetrate the pack ice. In 1954, the Kista Dan finally broke through to reach the coast. They only had 12 days to build a few basic huts to survive the approaching winter. By the end of February 1954, 10 members of ANARI, Australian National Antarctic Research Expeditions, were ready for their first winter on the continent. So that was a, a flag-waving 
ceremony, you know, that you all, you all had to stake your claim and say, here we are and here we'll stay. And uh, one of the first things they did, even before they started building the huts, was to claim the territory. This is most important. Right ho, here I am on my way to Antarctica on the good German ship Iceberg in 1989, per favour of the Antarctic Division, and what was under what was called the Humanities Program, to take a motley lot of journalists, film crews, authors, politicians, and even an environmental philosopher. Or in the words of the National Party passenger Ian Cameron, member for Maranoa in those days, bludgers, wankers, and ferret strokers. <laughs> and, and, and how lucky we were. First, we had to go through the classic stages of a voyage to Antarctica with the storms of the Southern Ocean. And then that iconic moment, the sighting of the first iceberg. And then you saw bigger ones, proof that there is indeed rather more ice under the sea than, uh, than, than you can see on top. Well, Iceberg couldn't break the ice any more robustly than Kister Dan in the old days, so we sat at the ice edge for two weeks, going mildly stir-crazy, at a reputed $90,000 a day in charter fees. One of my press colleagues, the Austrian photographer Chris uh, Sattelberger, uh, said that when he first saw Mawson Station, it looked like a container terminal into which somebody had just thrown a bomb. <laughs> The old mess hut on the right was uh, still being used in 1989, that was one of the original buildings, while the red shed, the new accommodation block uh, at, at, at the back there, was, uh, was being built. Communications, of course, were taking a great leap forward from Morse code, which, which they were. Now, this is inside the old communications hut, very much in transition at that stage. Much of the weather data coming in was still coming in on punch tape. Now, one of the great pluses of being at Mawson in 1989 was that the husky dogs were still there. These wonderful animals. But it used to be said that if things were getting personally rough at the station, you could always go up to the dog lines. They were always pleased to see you. And how lucky was I to be able to uh, go on a dog sled run on the sea ice at Mawson. Here we are uh, heading out from uh, Mawson Station across the sea ice. I mean, can you imagine what a fantastic experience that was? Yes, that's, that's something that I'll, I'll remember. All the Huskies left Mawson in 1993 as a result of strict environmental guidelines under the Madrid Protocol because they were introduced species. I think as introduced species, uh, human beings have done a lot more damage to the Antarctic environment than the dogs ever did. Let's uh, fast forward now to 1994 <laughs> when I went down with the ABC film crew to film uh, Breaking the Ice and we went on the supply and uh, research ship uh, the Aurora Australis, and here she is in the pack ice, uh, showing her very useful aft helicopter deck. We were at this stage off the coast of Casey, waiting to, to fly in. We had to do six half-hour programs and a 90-minute documentary in six weeks, and uh, it was a pretty intense experience. Now, we managed to get a film crew onto the first chopper into Casey after seven months of isolation. Casey is the first of the Antarctic stations to be completely rebuilt. Now, when you're making a film, it always involves the presenter, in particular, doing silly stunts. Um, I'd never abseiled in my life, but I was just about to. Now, filmmaking also depends on lucky breaks. And this was a beauty. One of the helicopter pilots discovered an emperor penguin colony near Casey that had never been noticed before. And then we went on to Davis Station, which has been likened to a mining camp near Mount Isa in, in, in high summer, in the Vestfold Hills, uh, which is a huge ice-free area. In early spring, the famous fjords of the Vestfold Hills are still covered in ice. Now, uh, in Anari, in the, the Antarctic Division term for a fun outing in Antarctica, is called a jolly. This was a mega jolly, as we were to fly by squirrel, two squirrel helicopters, a hundred miles away, inland, climbing up the ice sheet to the plateau, which can rise up to, but let's say where we were going was about 8,000 feet up. Uh, to meet up with a tractor train that was carrying out ice sheet measurements. 
And um, even though um, we're in choppers, this, this wouldn't be a, a great place for a forced landing. Now, this shot needs explaining. Now, I'm standing on the edge of a huge grounded iceberg. Now, as we were going along in our choppers over the grounded icebergs that were coming off the coast, Tony said, why don't you do one of those to camera pieces you people are so fond of doing on top of one of those icebergs? I thought, that seems a very good idea. So we talked to each other on the radio and we landed on the edge of one of these icebergs. Uh, I might add, this is, this is when, you, when you're left on an iceberg, uh, in any sort of ice situation, you're supposed to have safety gear, bivy bag, nothing. We were all hung over, actually. <laughs> Not many people in the world ever get a chance to do this. I'm actually standing on top of an iceberg that's broken off the coast of Antarctica. Look at the overhang. I've <laughs> never felt so isolated. There were two and helicopters and six blokes standing there. <laughs> Anyway, we finally made it to Mawson Station. This is, this is on the, what they call the West Arm, uh, across from the station, where there's uh, people who, uh, and people do die in Antarctica. It's a very dangerous place. And uh, for me, it was a, a, a welcome return to Mawson for the first time since I first went there in 1989, where I had visited the same, uh, the same spot. Before I left Hobart, my 88-year-old father asked me would I bring him back from Antarctica a slab of glacier ice to put in his whiskey. Well, I guess that this ice is possibly about 20,000 years old, considerably older than him, and I hope the old bugger appreciates it, and I might even share it with him. I think that should be enough. Excellent. Now... The moment we have been waiting for. Indeed, indeed. They tell me that this, the glaciologists say, this could be from 20,000 years to 100,000 years, Father. Is that so? And if you put it up to your ear, you should be able to hear. Even my ear? Crackle, crackle, I can hear it. crackle. Oh, my God. You can. <laughs> There's no doubt. And that's the air bubbles from... No doubt, whatever. That's the air bubbles trapped in it from God knows how many years ago. So, well, from Mawson Station Iceberg to here. Cheers. Take it, Tim. There's no trouble. Now, I do have one last Antarctic adventure to relate. When I went south for the last time in January 2008. Now, as it happened, we knew we were nearing a big band of uh, pack ice as it could be seen on the radar. Everyone was looking down. What they weren't expecting to see was a 30 metre ice cliff stretching into infinity. We were only 400 metres off, heading for this thing at seven knots. Well, you can't pull these ships up in, you know, in a, in a ship's length. Well, the, the skipper went white and got back to the controls and put the engines into reverse and put the bow thrusters on. And everyone, apparently, just stood there silently watching see, as this got closer and closer and closer. Well, finally, the, we, we got to within 50 metres of it. So that's as close as we got. And then the bow thrusters kicked in and we started to turn away. Now, what we had actually reached was not the edge of the pack ice, but it was the flank of one of those huge icebergs that had uh, broken off the Ross Ice Shelf. It was 164 kilometres long and 15 kilometres wide. <laughs> and our voyage leader, uh, always wanting to capitalise on interesting things that were happening, got on the uh, loudspeaker system and he said, well, he said, we've, uh, we've seen the first iceberg. You want to come up? <laughs> you want to come up and have a look at it? So um, he then went off the bike, you see, and turned to the skipper and said, look, how about we, we cruise down beside this a bit and, you know, show people what one of these things are like? And the skipper said, we have already been too close. <laughs> <laughs> but look, um, there we are. That's it, and thank you for having me. Mm -hmm.